Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Pinkham.com Norwich City podcast. Just a few days away from the first pre-season friendly at Kings Lynn Town. Pre-season training well underway. We're not going to talk too much about England. There's uh, enough of that all over the place. It's been a tumultuous few days, obviously, but uh, I'm I'm sure you don't really need us to, to go over it all again. So we will focus on Norwich City Matters. Dave Freezer here alongside Connor Southwell and Paddy Davitt, also coming to you on Future Radio 107.8 FM. Boys, how are we doing? Connor, how's things? Good, good. Yeah, uh, I've uh, recovered from uh, a slight cold, which yeah, anyone who listened to Window Watch on Friday might have heard me suffering quite badly. Um, significantly better now, which is good. Obviously, the England game, which... I don't particularly want to relive, so I'm glad we don't have to speak about it particularly. Uh, and yeah, now really excited for for Friday, actually, in the start of pre-season. Um, probably obviously ramped up by by what's happened in the last few days and another one through the door. It, it feels all very fresh and exciting again, doesn't it? Although no doubt, I think if we get into next sort of next week and nothing's really happened, then maybe that lull will set in again. But it feels like that in pre-season anyway, I think. Um, yeah, so it's looking forward to sort of seeing how they do at, at Kings Lynn and how they set up and stuff like that. I think it's... Um, it's going to be really interesting. Yes, the arrival of Pierre Lise Malou. We will come on to that very shortly. Uh, I am officially out of isolation today, so that's my celebration. Uh, still tested negative throughout, so uh, all good on that front. And no one I, that I know is, uh, has tested positive either, so sort of feels like a big waste of time. But that's the world we live in, isn't it? You've got to sort of uh, worry about protecting other people. I can I can assure you it was very difficult staying at home um, for both of those two England games and not watching it with, uh, with my dad and things like that. But worse things happen in the world. Pad, how are you getting on? Good, mate. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah, that was difficult, I'm sure, for you, DF. But um, and we'll get into it. We're going to speak to an expert on French football for at least Malou's inside track. But when Mio Rashica was unveiled, we spoke to a, a guy at The Guardian, Nick Ames. And Nick Ames was covering the Euros. Got pinged, missed the final. Was was supposed oh, to be really? the final, so uh, I'd imagine that would have been incredibly tough because obviously, you know, I think the way the, the the difference between the many years that England get to finals of major tournaments that probably would have been a career highlight, even with the result as it turned out. Sadly, but uh, yeah, yeah, there was you were not alone, mate. Put it that way, in, in oh, having to, having to to watch in a manner you probably wouldn't have normally watched. But uh, yeah, in terms of the game. That, well, it was a magnificent achievement for me anyway for them to get to the final. And and for that, you, you have to give them full credit. But uh, the final, I'm afraid, was even even when they scored early for me, it was the same old England. It was, you know, retreat. And um, and until I thought Gary Lineker and Gary Neville, we won't get into this in, in huge detail, but I will just say, you know, I thought they were spot on after the game. They said until England against the top, top tier nations and with the greatest respect, Denmark aren't in that bracket until they're able, whether it's Southgate or whoever, as a coach to to residually control the game better and create more of an attacking threat. Because Donnarumma, how many saves did he have to make? I think it was one tip over from John Stones. It wasn't even a header, it really come off his shoulder. Other than that, they didn't work him enough. So, yeah, brilliant achievement. But ultimately, missed opportunity, huge one. Uh, they'll never get a better chance to win a major tournament. And, and I think once we get past all the... Yes, they've made everybody proud and they've given us all these great memories. But if England are going to break that glass ceiling, they have to come up with uh, a method against the top tier nations that is far better than what they showed Sunday night, really. So, yeah, ultimately, great ride, but uh, frustration for me at the end because I think Italy were there for the taking if they'd have. And, you know, they've got a the perfect start. You go 1 0 up, you should be pushing on. But whenever I hear that flaming band strike up, you know, the, uh, the great escape. <laughs> music then it's it, it i fear because every tournament i've ever watched with england it is kind of can we can we repel invaders and protect our flag than actually going and getting their flag and until they change that mindset in the top top tier games then i think we've we set fair for more disappointment but yeah overall great tournament yeah, I, once we didn't get the second goal before half time, I, I kind of had that sinking feeling, and, and certainly once it went to penalties, I sort of I gave up. But poor old Jordan Pickford making the two saves. But we won't get into all the stuff that surrounded the game, which has obviously been very, very depressing. But uh, nice to see a couple of messages from two of the Norwich young lads, Josh Martin and Matthew Dennis. They came through the Arsenal youth system with Bakayo Saka, didn't they? And they both were among the many, thankfully, supportive voices for him because, uh, you know, a real, real tough moment for a 19-year-old lad. But there we go. On to Qatar 
next year end of next year quite strangely isn't it so um we can part the international thoughts for for now but thankfully from a norwich city point of view we, we kind of the, the dial moved quite quickly didn't it and and on to tuesday and the signing arrives after a bit of overnight speculation leaked from from france and a, a bit of talk about a, a flight from nice to france which uh, as we'll come on to was uh, ended up being a bit of a two and two equals five situation but um to kick things off with uh, um, a bit of expert advice from a, a lad you had a chat with connor jeremy smith who is a french football expert and um, we'll we'll kick off with uh, his thoughts on pierre lee's malou he's a classic number eight which is uh you know, the, the shirt number he was wearing, proper central midfielder who kind of is is a great link between defence and attack, can do a little bit of everything, reasonable tackler, comfortable in the ball, nice range of passing and a decent shot from outside the area as well. Um, can take set pieces, a good crosser. So, um, yeah, I mean, not spectacular at anything, but can do a little bit of it all. And he's pretty versatile as well. Doesn't just play central midfield, but can fill in sort of on both wings if need be, push up a little bit more. If he has to, he can kind of drop back and sit in front of the defence. So a, re a real sort of all-rounder. And then in terms of off the pitch or attitude or whatever, a, a real gem. Like he's, he kind of, he started, he only became a professional at 22. He went through, he was originally at Bordeaux and, um, their youth set up and was let go. Um, but even then, he's all, all, all the quotes he's ever given with it. You know, I don't know if I was really wanted to be a professional footballer at that time anyway. So he kind of went the amateur football route, which I think in a lot of cases actually maybe takes some things away because you haven't had that, you know, 24 hours a day grounding from sort of 14, 15, 16, that you've got maybe a more perspective and a wider wider world view about, I don't know, work ethic and teamwork outside football, that kind of thing. So he's, you know, he comes across as really mature, really nice guy. He's very appreciative of everything he's he's been able to achieve and, and yeah, sort of a top teammate, I think. So overall, I think... Um, a nice, a nice little buy there by Norwich. Yeah, which is always good to hear, isn't it? Um, you can f hear that and watch that full uh, interview on the Pink and YouTube channel. Um, I I'd imagine we'll put it out in our audio feed as well uh, after the podcast has gone out. So uh, keep uh, an ear and an eye out for that. But yeah, Connor, this kept us busy yesterday, and it's. I think it's generated a fair bit of excitement. Um, you know, this guy, I don't mean you describe him as a, as a star of French football or anything, but he's been playing consistently in the top half of, of Ligue 1. He's got, what, 150 appearances at that level, has been playing for a big club in Nice. In terms of French football, he may not excite French pundits and stuff, but in terms of a team just promoted from the championship, to add somebody of that kind of calibre seems like a really sensible move, particularly for the sort of uh, price tag that we're hearing it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a there's a clip actually later on in, in that video with Jeremy where he kind of sums it up pretty well, which is that every team doesn't have 11 star players. Sometimes you need three or four where they just perform at a consistent level every week. And if you've got someone who can do that in the Premier League, particularly for what Norwich City want to achieve, irrespective of the result or their form or their confidence, that's going to be really pivotal, I think, to drive the team on. So in, in that regard, maybe what he says is correct in terms of unspectacular, that, that sort of word. Um, but I don't think that means it isn't exciting for Norwich City and perhaps what he could offer for, for Norwich's midfield. And um, again, a bit of an all-rounder, someone who's, who's very athletic. We, we know that Norwich are, are scouting players based on sort of physicality and their physical data and, and stuff like that. And yeah, the fee, which is what 3.5 million up front, probably a 5 million package if, if you include all the add-ons and whatnot. Seems like a good deal for someone who, who's got an abundance of experience in, in Ligue 1, which is, um, which is a, a really good league by all accounts. So on paper, this looks like a, an absolute sort of no-brainer, I think, when the opportunity presents itself to Norwich, um, considering his pedigree, his CV, what he could offer as well. And um, that consistency, as, as I kind of said right at the start, I think could be really important beyond maybe Kenny McLean in their last Premier League campaign. I didn't think they really had a midfielder capable of just churning out performances, so to speak, being that six or, six or seven out of ten every week. You need that kind of um, continuity, I think, in, in your team. And if you've got someone with experience who can provide that, and they've also got it now in defence, I think, with, with Ben Gibson, who maybe I'd file in a similar bracket. 
if you get that throughout the team, then that could be enough just to get you results or hang on to results in certain positions. Uh, I always think back to that December when Norwich took the leading games but didn't have the sort of now or ability to see those games out. And in the end, that proved pretty pivotal, didn't it, to to how their, their season shaped up. If you've got a few of these players in there, maybe that's the difference between losing those games and drawing those games. And every point, as we know, in the Premier League is crucial. So I, I think this is one that um, is really smart, actually, and um, a, a really clever bit of business by Norwich. And it's going to be fascinating to see how he kind of goes into the midfield mix. I'm sure we'll come on to that probably in a more wider point. But I think for me, and, and I haven't been deterred from this for everything that Norwich City are doing in the transfer window feels like it's geared towards a, a shift in how they set up and how they're going to approach it. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see if we see sort of the fruits of that in, in pre-season. Yeah, what did you make of it, Pad? Um, you, you're off duty, weren't you, after working uh, over the weekend? But do you see this as a as a positive, positive addition when you think that this is added to sort of similar, similar calibre player in Rashica from, from Werder Bremen? And then Gilmore and Gunn, I suppose we can say, certainly in their younger years, have both shown uh, Premier League potential. Um, so, yeah, how, how do you see this fitting in? Well, intriguing, really, because, you know, listening to Jeremy, what he said there in that little clip, um, looking at where he's played in terms of the positions on the pitch, he, he seems to be, and you don't want to pigeonhole him as, a, you know, a jack of all trades, master of none, but he does seem seemingly come with a, a label that he can play in a variety of midfield roles, which, in a broader point, uh, was going to allow Daniel to be as flexible as, as they need to be in the Premier League and, and not this slavish adherence to, say, a 4 2 3 1, which is their nominal starting position mainly under him. I, I think you could see various different formations. You know, Connor's touching on a 4 3 3. That's possible as well. Yeah, and and ultimately, I think the more of these type of players who are, are comfortable in different positions and ask different responsibilities and different roles then the greater chance I think we will see of a bit more of a nuanced approach from Daniel in terms of his setups and his flexibility. And, you know, I can't wait to see, you know, as we get in, it sounds like he's, well, he clearly is still in France, so he's not going to be available for for, for the Lynn game on Friday. Probably a bit of a stretch to think he might even make the, the Colney games. But as we get into pre-season, the back end of the Sheffield United, Gillingham less so, but certainly the Newcastle game, how Daniel is setting his teams up for those games, I think will tell us a lot. And then within that, where where he sees this guy, but to echo Connor's point, for, for the money they've paid, for the the pedigree it seems of player they've got, it's a fantastic business. Very very you know similar. We had a week or two back, Thomas Delaney links that sort of more established in terms of the, their their age profile midfielder, central midfielder. But you know, not there was anything really in that tangibly from the Norwich end, but a thirty million pound label as opposed to a three million pound label. That is that is the dictionary definition of Stuart Weber in, in recruitment in terms of uh, you know bringing in players who will improve what they've already got, and you know you look at his pedigree. I think he probably is going to be an upgrade on a Rupp, maybe maybe even a Kenny McLean in time. But uh, where he plays on the pitch, I think at this stage, we, you know, it is guesswork until until we see how Daniel envisages. Is he more of an attacking midfield option, or maybe more of a you know sort of sitting? protects his back four type of option. It seemingly is he can do those traits. And, um, you know, what it means now in terms of the, the, the re further recruitment in the central midfield or, or midfield area generally, uh, time will tell. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they try and do another one in that area of the pitch because, you know, ultimately you've lost Francic, you lost Tete, Oli Skip's gone back, doesn't look like he's coming again um, purely in terms of, numbers in that area of the pitch they they needed to do a bit of business and they, they brought two new two new lads in in him and Gilmore so whether that's the end of the central midfield additions time will tell yeah and there was a bit of fun in the background to this wasn't there Connor a bit of a an Amadou feel to it in terms of the sort of tracking of planes and things like that but that that all ended up being a bit of a, a bit of a waste of time and you know as much as we talked up his sort of consistency and and maybe his all-round ability he, he has shown he's got an eye for goal over in France as well as he scored, scored some crackers he also I mean we're always wary of supercuts on YouTube aren't we but he seems to like a back heel <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does, doesn't he? Yeah, on, on the plane stuff, he's he's still in France, isn't he? So um, yeah. whoever that was that's flown over from Nice to Norfolk, I, I don't think we'll ever know. But uh, it certainly wasn't him. So that's that's a, an interesting point. Uh, he's set to join up with him later this week, isn't he? I think Kings Lynn will, will probably come a bit too early for him. But um, yeah, I, 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 I should probably make a transfer window bingo card because I was waiting for a sort of a, <laughs> a aeroplane tracker 
rumor to to emerge and uh, and and there we go not to be disappointed so that that was that was all good fun and games um it, and remind me if you're the second part of your question sorry um well we all, we also had um ollie skip didn't we um out being pictured outside a, a house in norwich so that that was another part of the bing, the bingo card but yeah the, the second side of it was uh the goals uh that he scored yes. he's got an eye for goal and and as i say he yeah, likes back heel as well yeah, and that, that's what Norwich didn't have enough of last time, was it? It was they were too reliant on Timu Puki. They didn't have those options from midfield that could maybe chip in, not necessarily with ten goals or whatever, but just one here and there. And, and I guess if you have that threat from the edge of the box, then sometimes that that's enough to make sure you get a one nil win, which is crucial in the grand scheme of things when games in the Premier League are played on such fine margins. Any advantage you can give yourself, I think, is a bonus. So that ability to strike from range, I think, could end up being a, a really important one if you can get a goal or two, um, particularly away from home in a game where maybe Norwich are under the cosh a bit and have to have to sort of soak up a lot of pressure. If they can hit a team on the break and, and, and he can net one from range, then brilliant. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think all those elements and, and those kind of fine margins is 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 often I think what what Stuart Webber searches for and and Pad said it there. This is a kind of typical Stuart Webber signing, isn't it? You, you see an opportunity in the market and then you pounce on it. And we know France is a market they've been watching for a while. I think the the financial sort of elements around that. There, there's obviously a lot of French clubs struggling because of coronavirus, but also because of a, a collapsed TV deal, which has left the league in um, in a bit of ruin, to be honest. So there's a lot of talent maybe there that for a lot cheaper than perhaps it would have been 12 months ago as well. So all of those elements probably add up to a really good opportunity that they probably couldn't turn down. Um, and, and yeah, Paddy's alluded to it there, but I think they're probably, I don't think they are done in midfield yet. I think the, the fact that Skip is set to, to stay at Spurs or certainly that's the noises at the moment would suggest that they need to fill that kind of defensive midfield hole because I'm, I, I'm not sure Billy Gilmore is it. I don't know if um, Le Malou is it either. So I think they, they probably do need an extra one there. And then I guess the, the debate turns to strikers, doesn't it? And probably centre-backs as well and and how they solve, solve those issues. And what's really interesting for me, and, and I did ask Jeremy this off air, um, I've seen a lot of kind of like graphs of his and, and his sort of aerial data is is pretty horrendous. And I, I kind of said to him, does he not just lie head in it? And I think he, he just turned around and said, that's just France generally. For, for whatever reason, players don't really head the ball in the in the same degree. He gave an example of um, William Saliba, who's a, who's Arsenal at the moment. And um, apparently a lot of Arsenal fans have been looking into that and saying, well, well that's maybe why Mikel Arteta doesn't fancy him because of the, the, the sort of metrics around that. But he said, that's just French football. They, they don't have that sort of level of aerial competition that maybe we have in this country. So I guess that's going to be an interesting element as well. Um, and, and the other is his physicality. It's um, it, it seems, and, and, and we know that that's, that's something that they wanted more of. They wanted more legs and more options in, in midfield in that regard, those who could compete. There was a, um, a anecdote, I forget who told it, it might have been Kieran Scott um, of a player at Anfield, I think it might have been Todd Campwell, when he said that Jordan Henderson was 40 yards away and he took a touch and then Jordan Henderson was right behind him. That's the pace of the Premier League and that's what they wanted to compete with. So hopefully he offers that as well. But um, yeah, a really interesting addition for lots of reasons. It's um, As Pad alluded to, it's going to be fascinating to see how he, how he sort of fits in and where they decide to play him because he seems capable of, of kind of doing a bit of everything really yeah that aerial point's interesting because we've seen at the last couple of tournaments haven't we that England's set pieces have been really good you know you think about that Maguire header um in the uh what semi uh, well the Ukraine game sorry um yeah I, I wonder whether it, it, it's that far away in the future uh we won't get into this now but whether you know aerial contests will one day be banned in football because of where we've uh you know all, all the stuff we've seen in the past of of former players um obviously having such serious brain injuries and things like that but um that's a, a totally different thing uh, another one for your uh, bingo card billy gilmore was spotted at colney wasn't he um so it just needs to be morrison's or something really to to really count um but pad yeah to expand on on the point of, with midfield then and when we did our live video after Lise Malou was um, unveiled Tuesday morning, a lot of people were saying, is that the end of the billing pursuit? Um, I think realistically, we are probably looking at one more body in midfield now, aren't we? We've seen Ollie Skip is back in training with Tottenham and stuff. But do you think billing is that player? Because I, I think really in my head, I'm, I'm looking for someone more defensive, more in that in the Amadou mould not him specifically but someone with a bit of muscle you know someone like under Manu Matic at Man United obviously you're not going to get someone of that class but I, I think they need someone else with a bit of size and, and power in that midfield mix so who's got a more of a more of a defensive focus yeah I wouldn't disagree Dave and um 
as Connor said, as Stuart Weber has said, one of the big lessons him and Daniel took away from the last time was the physicality was lacking consistently. That's why Kenny McLean was probably labelled uh, irreplaceable by Daniel because he his data would, would suggest that he he was able to offer that more robustness, certainly in the middle of the park, that Norwich, to a man, in the rest of the squad didn't really possess. And that is the seam that will run through and is running through all their recruitment this summer, that, that, that it isn't just about the technical ability of a Premier League player. The physicality and the athleticism is is another level from the Football League from where they've just exited. So if that is the case and and they, they feel they need, and you probably look at it and, yes, they're, you wouldn't say either Gilmore, Rashid, for that matter, or now Lee Malou are an Ollie skip like for like. So taking such an integral cog out of the machine um, and he's not coming back, we'll say, hypothetically, that will need to be filled somehow or other. And um, I don't think Kenny McLean's the answer. So and if those new signings aren't the answer, then, yeah, I think it's logical to assume what that would mean for Billing. Well, I think for me, it's probably moving away from that now. If they've brought this guy in and they're looking to do another defensive holding midfielder, that isn't really Philip Billing. Um, so... And they still ideally would like to do something centre back, and increasingly it seems top end of the pitch as well. So I think the window for billing is is narrowing quite alarmingly now. If it's not already closed, and if Skip is definitively not going to be coming, then they will they will I think look to do something in that area of the pitch because you know yes, as we as we're discussing at length here, there will be refinement from what stood him in such good stead in the championship. But also some of the core principles, I think, would have to stay the same. And whether that's the, the back four and Tim Krull, their defensive resolution that they brought up from the championship, he'll want to build on that. Um, whether it's how they progress the ball through the further areas, the attacking areas of midfield, or for me, whether it's a nolly skip type ballast at that key part of the pitch to both protect and also set the tempo as well, in tandem maybe with a Billy Gilmore. So, yeah, I think it's it's probably safe to assume they will want to do another one and they probably will be looking for a, a midfielder who is more tilted towards a, an Ollie Skip defensively sound option. I guess we also shouldn't forget about Jacob Sorensen. I mean, we'll, we'll see how he's, he is probably going to be playing that defence midfield role in the early stages of pre-season, isn't he? So maybe he's got an opportunity to lay down a marker. He has got a bit of physicality on his side, hasn't he? But we've just not, not seen enough of him to make that judgment yet. So if he could step up, I mean, it would be a, quite a significant step up to be considered a Premier League option. Then that would be a, put an interesting complexion on it as well. And as I think we said in a previous pod, with Billing, with all the stuff that goes around him, Scott Parker, the finances at Bournemouth, etc., maybe Farkas does see him as that's the role he should be playing. He should be a defensive midfielder because he's clearly got the size and, and the muscle, isn't he? Um, if he's got the work rate as well, that's probably the big question that most people are, uh, would ask of Philip Billing. I'll stick with you just for the, the second pad and um, let's move it forward to the strikers. Um, we've seen Josh King has gone to Watford, who um, is a player we think Norwich were, were potentially interested in, but pretty quickly realised it wasn't going to work financially, whereas Watford have a bit more financial flexibility, don't they? I think they had five seasons in the Premier League before the relegation, so and they've got wealthy owners and stuff, haven't they? But there's uh, this chat from the Mirror has sort of um, dropped in this this tweet, which has got people talking about Ida and Hugo, hasn't he? And we saw Hugo was linked with interest from Forrest last week, but the last we'd heard, it sounded like Ida was very much front and centre of the plans for Norwich, wasn't it? Well, exactly. And um, nothing I've heard in the last period of time suggests that isn't the case. So um, I, I think, I mean, it, the tweet itself was either or that they could possibly let a Hugel or a, or, or an Adam Eder out on loan. I think if Hugel was to go, there'd be no prospect of Adam Eder, irrespective of what Norwich mm. do in terms of the incomings in that area of the pitch, which they're looking to do, clearly. Um, all, all the noises would suggest now Adam Armstrong was a player they, they were looking at justifiably doesn't look like that's going to happen there's an interest firmer in other areas of the Premier League now but um, no I don't see if Jordan Hugel is to depart and by all accounts that is more likely of those two both for maybe Norwich's view of him in terms of what he could offer in a Premier League mix but also I think they'll add himself he's he is now if not 30 he's, he's not far off it and, and he needs regular game time now at his age I would have thought um, he strikes me as a lad who, who wants to be playing. I don't. I never get the sense he's one who's happy to sit on the bench and be a cheerleader. He's, he did that role very well last season, but um, I think now if he can see the writings on the wall for him in terms of Premier League opportunities, 
then there will be suitors in the championship. And then it just comes down to making sure the financials are right, whether it's a permanent exit or a loan. And if that is to play out, as as I would expect it to, and George Hugel is no longer in the building, then I don't see any prospect of Adam Eder being allowed to go because what that would essentially leave you is Timu Pluki plus possibly another striker. But until that other striker is in the building, and from what we understand, there's nothing very well advanced with any striker incoming at this stage. So you're leaving yourself too exposed if you were to sanction a, uh, a Jordan Hugel and an, and an Adam Eder exit with no striker coming the other way on the horizon. So I think that's uh, I think that's um, some kite flying going on there uh, at this stage of the summer. But um, obviously things change. You know, we, we've seen how, you know, Aya moved along and, and down ultimately down a cul-de-sac. But, you know, what, what stands true here as we sit here on the 14th of July isn't necessarily the case on the 14th of August, is it? So um, if they've managed to bring in a striker and they've got four on the books in, in terms of Hugel and Eder, then the probability is one of Hugel or Eder will be moving on, won't they? Because um, you're not going to be carrying four frontline strikers into the Premier League, given you're, in, you're a team and a coach who only play one up top. So um, not at this stage. Don't see Adam Eder going at this stage, but things can happen. And, and what you assume might happen, i.e. with Jordan Hugel, might not. And if not, then I'm, there's no, let's be honest, there's no, there'll be no shortage of takers in the championship who would want to take Adam Eder on though, and that is for sure. But uh, I don't see it right here, right now, no. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting because as we sit here preparing for the Lynn game, and I think the Lynn game, Lincoln and the Huddersfield doubleheader, you're not reading too much into them. They're the fitness exercises really, aren't they? And then they step things up a little bit with, and, and in terms of calibre as well. But I, from looking at the players that we think they've got available for Lynn, I, I think Hugo's probably going to be starting and they'll need either on the wing because they haven't got many options. So um, and, unless some of the players have come into training this week that we um, uh, are, are yet to be aware of, then he, he looks like he's still in the mix. And and sort of, uh, only basing it on social media, Connor, but Hugo doesn't seem to be giving the impression of someone that has got any consideration of leaving Norwich at the moment that, you know, all his tweets and the, the banter with the teammates making Jacob Sorensen wear the England shirt on the, after the semi-final and um, how excited he was about the the home kit and things like that. He's not, he's certainly not given the impression of someone that's got uh, any expectation of leaving. No. And I guess that's the luxury for Norwich, isn't it? Because if it doesn't pan out the way that perhaps he and maybe the club would hope as well, and, and it doesn't gear towards what Paddy's sort of said there and, and him getting another move in the championship, which is, regular first team football, you don't get the impression that you've got someone that is going to sulk and is going to sort of throw their toys out of the pram. Yeah. You, you think that he's he's someone that you can sort of keep in the boat to, to keep the expression and and, um, and and someone who will be a good character around the place. And uh, we've, we've heard sort of Stuart Weber speak about cultural enablers before, haven't we? And I think he's, he's probably what in that category at the moment. You, you could probably put him in there with a few others. So I think Norwich is one of those where you probably wouldn't actively be looking to push him out the door, but Equally, if there was a solution for all parties that that was sort of um, agreeable for for both, that, then I think it's something they'd look at, isn't it? So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it suggests that there's there's anything imminent or anything like that. I think it's just one perhaps to watch between now and the summer. But certainly, if I was a, a Norwich fan, sort of, and, and the window closed and Jordan Hugill was still a Norwich City player, I wouldn't have any concerns about his commitment or um, his sort of willingness to play and, and and prove himself because I think he will want to do that. So. Um, I think Norwich, in, in a weird sort of way, are in a, a win-win situation with this because if he does leave and he does depart, then it will be on terms agreeable to all of them and he probably leaves with everyone's best wishes. If he stays around, then you've got a good character there and someone who's well-liked in the dressing room that isn't going to sort of rock the boat and, and upset people. So I think wh whichever way it goes, it's, it's, probably, um, it's probably a positive for Norwich, I would say. But you know, obviously for, for their plans and, and looking towards the pitch, you'd probably suggest that ideally they'd probably want to rec uh, sort of uh, recruit another one. Uh, I would imagine maybe someone with, with the ability to challenge Timu um, greater or, or maybe even be a step ahead of him, I, I suppose. It depends maybe what they're looking for around that position and, and the funds that they're willing to spend as well. So it is going to be really interesting to see how that pans out because as you said there, the tone has shifted from the start of the window where it was very much a striker it didn't seem like it was sort of high up their list of priorities whereas now it's flipped and it seems like it's it's kind of gone up a little bit whether that's because um sort of he's mapped out his situation he said actually I would like to go and play regular first team football or whether that's because of Timu's situation in the Euros and not looking 
fully 100% in the injury, we'll never know. But um, it, it's been an interesting shift and it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves, as Paddy says, in the next month or so, because uh, the transfer window is very fluid and opportunities may present themselves with players like they have with Le Malou that Norwich didn't predict a month ago that they can't sort of turn down, so to speak, which may shift everything again. So it's um, it's very difficult, I think, to predict anything in transfer windows and it's just going to be fascinating, I think, to see whichever those options are, who they are, come, I guess, the game against Liverpool, but perhaps more pressingly, sort of a couple of weeks after that when the window closes. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see Pukki's first start being the Newcastle game, the final friendly, because they've got to make sure he gets some real rest and as, you know, A, a the ankle's fine and, and B, his stamina levels are recovered because as, as we and Daniel and everyone has said so many times, that guy's played a, an unbelievable amount of football in recent years and they've got to get him sharp. He is so important to them still as things stand. So obviously if they make an addition, then that might change the complexion of that a bit. But I don't think there's any Norwich fans as we sit today who are rushing Jordan Hugel out the door because A, all those things you said there about him being a good character, but also he's a good bench option. You know, if you want to chase a game the last 10 minutes and chuck someone on to cause a bit of chaos. Uh, and there's a few direct teams in the Premier League, you know, your Burnleys and Palace, We'll have to see how they develop under Vieira, but where he might be a decent option. So keeping him around till January might not be the worst thing in the world, given that Norwich really need to make sure they have a, a better first half of the season than they did two years ago. Um, so we shall see how that one uh, that one develops. But we mentioned the kit there as well. Uh, Pad, what, what did you make of it? I, I think it's quite sharp. I think it's quite a nice um, sort of balance between modern and traditional, really. Yeah, I'm probably not the best man to ask, mate. You, 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 you boys with your Norwich fan hats on probably can come at it. But, I, but I was on Saturday morning, and uh, certainly that first dropped it dropped officially at nine, and that first hour social media was pretty much universally. This is a kit. This is a kit. This is this is the best kit I've seen for a while. Da 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 da. da. I, I heard of 20, 25 minute waits on the on the phone lines to the club shop to or the ticket up the the club shop element uh, to try and order the kit on the club website. So um, the people have spoken. They, they seem universally. I, I think I've seen one or two, but you're inevitably going to get that who questioning some of the, uh, maybe some of the logos, the shirt sleeve logo and the, the Lotus, how that looks and how many washes it would take for them, maybe those to come off. But uh, that's not an area of my expertise. So, uh, but um, I, I'm not going to be going and buying it myself, but then I wouldn't buy, buy any Norwich kit. So, uh, but I, I, it, visually, I quite like it. Yeah, I think um, I think any fears that maybe Joma coming on board was going to take take the the sort of Norwich kit time timeline in a, in a negative direction were probably been assuaged, and, and we'll wait to see what they what they do with your way in the third kit. I've seen some really nice concept kits. That seems to be the thing on social media now, which is just fans hoping for a uh, saw a nice sort of a, there was a black and sort of the the Lotus symbol was in almost a gold sort of black brownie kit. Uh -huh. That looked very nice. I think I might be tempted to buy that one. Uh, if that That's was like the livery of the F F1 car almost. Yeah, so exactly, exactly. Yeah, so uh, I, I could go I could go with that. I could get on board with that. But uh, yeah, as I say, uh, not my opinion that counts here, but of the Norwich fans and majority, I would say, even now three or four or five days on, uh, seem to be lapping it up. So uh, yeah, let's just hope uh, there's no petrol blue second or third kits is all I'm <laughs> saying. Yeah, the one that stuck in my mind, I think that was from last year, was somebody did a concept kit of um, the old Asics kit, but with a rainbow yes. stripe. Isn't it? And, and given the, well, as as behind me, the you know the sort of dedication to to key workers and and obviously all the LGBT um, sort of side of of the rainbow symbolism and stuff as well. That seems like a, a really apt thing to do. So I, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I haven't got any kind of in the knowledge uh, <laughs> sort of. Um, look at the other kits or anything so don't don't take what i'm saying for granted or anything like that but that seemed at the time to be one that the club should have been registering and thinking we might do that next year um but yeah kind of what did you what did you make of it i thought the arms look um i, I thought they looked quite good is it right somebody mentioned in the q a on monday that there was a long sleeve version didn't they i didn't know if that was a wind up i didn't check <laughs> yeah well, well first i'm glad you've come to me as, as someone who's obviously an expert in fashion as you can see um <laughs> yeah the, yeah i have i've seen uh all i've seen is a screenshot of the the long sleeve shirt which is um a bit banana in pajamas, to be honest. Um, that sort of it feels a bit like that. The arms, but uh, yeah, certainly the short sleeve version. I'm a I'm a big fan of. I think it's um, 
It's one of the better ones. I don't think it's one that will live long in the memory, but I, I guess shirts and seasons tend to be combined, don't they? So um, maybe how you do in a season is is how well the, the, the shirt ends up doing. Um, I'm not quite sure. There's probably a, a wider study to be done by people who are a lot more intelligent than me. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's all right. It's yellow and green. It does the job. I'm, I'm quite happy with it. I'm, I'm sure that I certainly echo what Pad has said. I think every, everyone that I've seen seems quite happy with it and it seems to have gone down quite well. And uh, with ever these things, it's um, it's about how they look on the pitch. I guess we get a first look at, uh, at that on, on Friday. I've seen there's, there's quite a nice subtle sort of print, although I've seen a few people say it looks like kitchen roll, that sort of style on it. Um, but yeah, it looks good. It looks good. Looks smart. Uh, it was nice to see Lucas Rook reading the uh, the evening news in our in in the announcement video as well, yeah. which was good. So good to see the players tune into our into our content, or maybe not at times. I'm not sure, but um, but yeah. Ne- ne- next is the awake it and making sure that they don't make it blue. I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we shall see. But yeah, mo- most people um, that I saw reacting to it seem to be pretty pleased with it. And you can, you know, they announced JD Sport as uh, the sh- sleeve sponsor, didn't they? And uh, as another sort of partner and combining two more mainstream um, outlets, I suppose, um, with Joma as the manufacturer and then getting on board with JD Sport, you can see that that look feels like it's got a bit of Premier League strategy behind it, doesn't it, in terms of distribution and raising your profile. And, you know, Joma supplies some some big clubs, don't they? Atalanta, Villarreal, Torino, I think, um, some of the national teams and things like that. So, um, yes, we shall all... Uh, wait and see what the away and third kit kit look like and i'm sure they'll follow in the next few weeks so um pad you get to see oh well oh no sorry i don't think you will get to see the game will you because you're off that week but coventry friendly is is confirmed isn't it Uh, at chesterfield so we've got kings in friday night then next tuesday it's lincoln at colney behind closed doors then the Friday, it's the double header against Huddersfield again behind closed doors. And then the final four games of preseason, Wednesday, July 28th, it's Coventry at Chesterfield Stadium. Uh, Sheffield United at Bramall Lane on the Saturday. Then the one Carrow Road friendly on August the 3rd on Tuesday night against Gillingham, hopefully, although they've just had to cancel, I think, three or four friendlies because they've had a COVID outbreak. So you'd hope at this distance from that game, they'll be recovered and stuff by that stage because obviously they've got a league one season to get ready for uh, Gillingham. So we also don't know the fan details about that yet. We're, we're waiting for that element of how many will be allowed at these games. Bramall Lane, for instance, will there be away fans? We don't know yet. And then it all finishes against Newcastle St. James's Park on August the 7th. So, Pad, we saw the players who were involved in the early stages of pre- pre-season. We had a few photos from that. The club put out a video and it's quite a limited group at the moment, isn't it? And I guess they're going to sort of come back in, in dribs and drabs in terms of the injuries and the international um, uh, players. Yeah, which every club, to a greater or lesser degree in the Premier League, are going to have to deal with that. I mean, it would be nice to, if Norwich had had some England players, but I mean, those bigger clubs which had a large contingent of England players, when are those guys? Because they'll now, you know, having gone this deep into the summer, they're going to have to go and... I saw Jaden Sancho who just completed his move to Manchester United from Borussia Dortmund. I think he he basically did his bits and pieces yesterday, medicals and what have you, and and, and now he's off uh, on holiday again. So, you know, it, it's a far more pressing issue. And, of course, I mean, you've done a few bits. Um, the Liverpool, their first opponent at the, the weekend of... August the 14th, you know, they're going to have one or two lads missing as well. Um, and not just England, but other countries as well. So, uh, you know, there was talk of Mo Salah going off to the Olympics with Egypt, but I think Liverpool have stepped in and said that isn't happening now. So um, it is a disrupting element for any Premier League head coach, but uh, less so for Norwich, I think. Um, I haven't double-checked in the last day or two, but I'd imagine the, the Euro contingent will be back in the building, certainly by next week. And... Um, Plenty of plenty of weeks still ahead to to build up. It'd be interesting who's on on duty Friday night at Lynn, To be fair, I mean they'll go as strong as they can, but but ultimately for, for all those reasons stated for Lee Malou, obviously probably not back in the country at that point, or if he is, maybe having to just await results of COVID tests. Uh, yeah. But that they're, they're going to maybe have to bring a few twenty threes along uh, for the ride at the walks on Friday. But um, but I for me, it's probably the probably the commentary game onwards when we'll we'll see a bit more of the the frontline options available for Daniel to, to pick and choose from. Yeah, I'm not overly concerned. You're right, I am off, Dave, so I'm missing the Cov game. But uh, if it had been the Rico, I wouldn't have been happy. I'd have probably have had to tell my wife uh, we might have to change our plans. But uh, thankfully, we haven't had to have that conversation. I'll let, the, I'll let it go on this occasion, seeing as I saw him twice 
albeit at St Andrews in the what uh, and one at St Andrews obviously, and then there was two at Cairo. Played them in the FA Cup, didn't we? So I've had my fill of commentary uh, and Norwich fixtures for now. So you boys go on and enjoy that, mate. Yeah, I'm missing the two games next week, uh, the Lincoln Huddersfield, because I'm off to Cornwall and then a, a mate's wedding, which is what made the uh, little stint in isolation even more nervy. <laughs> because if, the, if we had had a positive test at any point, then obviously that could have thrown our plans into uh, chaos. But as I keep saying, this is the world we're living in at the moment. You have to sort of navigate your way through it as best you can, don't you? Uh, but certainly looking forward to to that. Um, in terms of the, the players available for Friday, Connor, I mean, uh, I guess we'll see Angus Gunn in goal probably is going to be the only new new guy. I mean, in centre-back, it's going to be Omar Bamadeli and, and Zimmerman. There's not really any other options, particularly now they've let Famowo uh, out on loan to Charlton. Bashiri's making his way back from injury. Um, we don't think Sam Byron will be involved, do we? But then as you move through the team, they are definitely, if they're going to have a squad of um, 18, 20 players or whatever and, and want to make wholesale changes at half-time, then there's going to be a need for quite a few players. I mean, I guess we've seen Sam McCallum go to QPR and we think players like Sanani are going to go to uh, go out on loan. So I'll, I'll, they weren't in the training pictures that we've seen so far, but maybe they're the sort of players that we'll see involved in the game, I guess. Quite possibly, yeah. I, I guess it's it's going to be really interesting to see how they plug the gaps, which is fair. Obviously, we don't know about Rashidza yet and whether he's um, in the building or, or training fully or whether he's still in quarantine. We don't cr quite know that situation and, and whether he's going to be ready for, for Friday night. But um, if he is in the building, then you'd imagine he'd be one that will that will feature whether from the start or from the bench, as you mentioned. Um, I, I think it probably will be what we sort of alluded to earlier. I think we'll probably see Ida and, and Campwell on the wings with, with maybe Jordan Hugo leading the line. I think the defence is probably fairly... Um, we could probably pick it today, I think, given that Aaron's is, is back from the, the pitches that we've seen in Ulis as well. And then probably Zimmerman and, and Omar Bamadeli, the, the, the defenders we've gone in goal. Midfielders are, are probably more interesting. Lucas Rook is, uh, seems to be back, doesn't he? And, and, and back in, in full training. So that would maybe suggest a Rook Sorensen midfield two, potentially. I, it's going to be really interesting, I guess, to see how... Daniel Farker puts it all together. Kieran Dowell is, is obviously training as well. So plenty of, of options, I think, there to to name an 11. It's just, as you mentioned, sort of what players we see involved um, beneath that. I, I guess, obviously, we'll, we'll probably have a, a young goalkeeper involved. Barden is, is obviously a, a Livingston. McGovern is is there as well. So, so I guess we'll probably see him at, at some point. Uh, I'm just trying to think through all the options in my head. So do yeah. jump in if you think of anyone else. But I think it, I think you're, it's going to have to be Ida, Cantwell and Dowell as the attacking three behind Hugo. Unless you're going to, if you assume that Lise Malou, uh, Rashica, Poheta, Hernandez are all unavailable. Um, we know McLean, Hanley, Gibson, um, are all unavailable. Yeah, there's there's not loads of options for that game, but it depends, you know, as we said earlier, it, it's a fitness run out at this stage. The result doesn't matter, but um, it'll be interesting at the Warts, but 1,500 fans um, is obviously going to be kind of the the big thing on the night. Um, we're all hoping to be there, but we'll have to see how things um, how, how things shape up. But I remember being there three years ago when Tamu Puki made his, I think that was his first appearance, and I was there with, with Chris Lakey, and he didn't, he wasn't too impressed by by team that day who didn't look particularly sharp he played in the 10 role behind jordan rhodes if i'm remembering that correctly and you know that just shows that you, you can't get too excited about preseason as no doubt we'll say over the next few pods you, you always have to caution because um things on the opening day can be totally totally different particularly once you get to the late friendlies as well and players start to worry about injury and looking after their fitness with Liverpool in mind and stuff like that so you always have just to have that little bit of uh, of caution don't you but yeah you mentioned Liverpool as well Pad that they they are in Austria I'm not quite sure how that's happened really given that Norwich weren't able to go to Germany and most Premier League clubs don't seem to have gone abroad, but they've managed it. Um, they've got friendlies against Stuttgart, Mainz and Hertha Berlin over there. So that's good Bundesliga calibre to be warming up with. And massively for them, Virgil van Dijk back in training after, you know, he was a massive, massive miss for them. It was second in to Lionel Messi in the Ballon d'Or in 2020, wasn't he? Basically was a huge part of them winning the title. But also Joe Gomez... Trent Alexander-Arnold and Joel Matip all back for them. So um, Liverpool shaping up um, shaping up well. Um, and as you say, they've got those internationals to come back. Um, I mentioned him earlier, Pad. Sam McCallum has gone to QPR. Um, so that loan that we had been um, teeing up has gone through. But that seems like a, a pretty good move for him, doesn't it? Well, I think 
think back to QPR at Car Road towards the end of last season, and they they gave them a lot, a lot of problems that night. And Warburton previously Rangers put that to one side, but the work he was doing at Brentford, you know, mm. with a with a maybe a club who were certainly you wouldn't put him in the front bracket of London powerhouses, but he, he, I mean, and obviously now Brentford have, have built on on the foundations that maybe he put in place all, all back then. You know, Alex Pritchard, I remember, was a very astute uh, piece of business that they got in on loan at, when he was at Tottenham at that point. But um, but the style of football, the brand that he likes to play up, yeah, I think I think it's fair to assume QPR will be in the conversation for the top six next season. Whether they'll have enough or not, but but in terms of progressing Sam McCallum through the gears with it with his development, then it it looks a perfect move at this stage of the summer because I think they'll be there or thereabouts. And um, you know he proved himself that he could play in the Championship last season, played thick end of forty starts for Coventry, but but in a team who, for the most part, it was about staying in the division. Now he's going to join a club who are aspirations to get in and in that top six and uh, as a result it, that's a different set of pressures and expectations and the, the, there was a hell of a lot of interest in him we were told at the start of the summer there was seven or eight clubs already picked the phone up to Stuart Webber um, within two or three weeks of the season so on the circuit Sam McCallum has made some waves in the championship last season and then QPR have won the race um, and now let's go and see because obviously we're looking at it in terms of what this means for Norwich and, and 12 months on from now, if Norwich are back in the Football League, we hope that isn't the case, but if they were to be, and Sam McCallum has played another 35, 40 games in a team who are at the right end of the table, you know, moving parts to all of this, who knows what that would mean for your new list if, if Norwich would come back down again, but, but there might be a player who is is a lot nearer to Norwich's first team plans than he is currently, and that's ultimately what this boils down to. Daniel doesn't feel, as he didn't last summer, that is quite near enough to what he envisages as his left-sided defensive options in the Premier League. So, you know, that has the potential to be a very good move for all parties concerned, I think. Yeah, I thought that might be the case with Famuo, with Charlton as well, but that's alone with a view to a permanent deal, isn't it? So um, in terms of if Norwich were uh, having to prepare for another championship season, that he might be someone that's well-placed, but it, it seems like they're, they're moving on from him. So um, we shall see. Right, let's move on to some questions. Um, we had uh, a few in. You can always get them across to us, the Pinkin accounts, Twitter, Facebook um, or Instagram, whichever you prefer. Um, the first one, Simon Meadows asks, how likely are Hanley, Gibson and McLean looking to be able to play against Liverpool? Uh, Connor, if I put that to you, I mean, in terms of the actual Liverpool game, I, I think we're, they're hopeful that those three will be back in contention. But whether all three will be in contention to start, it's a bit difficult to say at this point, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess the major question mark would probably come around Kenny McLean, given his, his quotes a couple of weeks ago about um, maybe a lack of progress in, in his recovery and that how I guess how that impacts his sort of schedule, and whether it pushes back his recovery a week or two, and how much a preseason he then sees, I, I guess is 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 put into that debate as well. So, in terms of starting contention, yeah, I, you would you'd be hopeful at that stage that all three will be uh, at the level they need to be to to start that game if required. But I, I don't think at this stage we can say that with absolute certainty. Um, particularly the, the defensive sort of duo, you you would hope are a lot closer than they are currently and sort of the all the videos that we've seen of Ben Gibson um seem positive as we yeah. sort of spoke about on the last pod I think of him going to Portugal and taking the physio with him and he seems to be going through a lot of work to to get himself back and there are also um clips I, I think it was when Angus signed and um the the club released that behind the scenes kind of footage he was there wasn't he um sort of doing work as well so hopefully all of the noises suggest that and, and Hanley's injury by all accounts um, means that he'll see some pre-season which again is a positive and if he can pick up the form that we've seen for him last season and also against England in the Euros then um, that's going to be very positive for Norwich as well so hopefully at this stage all of them potentially I, I, I'd probably lean towards more Gibson and, and Hanley being uh, available than McLean but that's not at this stage definitive there's what a month to go so that could all change pretty drastically couldn't it as as injuries sometimes do there are setbacks or things can speed up uh, um, so yeah we'll wait and see I suppose but hopefully all of them yeah, we shall see. And pre-season normally fr throws up fresh injury problems as well, doesn't it? We all remember Closer and Pritchard in that pre-season game at Cambridge when oh, that, that really sort of messed up plans for ahead of Farkas' first season, didn't it? So um, you've always got to be live to that. Um, a couple of... Well, 
a strange question from someone called Loz on Twitter says, when will Farker go to Everton? I'm fairly sure they just appointed somebody called Rafa Benitez. So I, I, I'm well, he'll, sure. he'll, he'll go there when Norwich are due to play him at Goodison Park, if that's what he means. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That is a very accurate point. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll wrap these two together for you, Pad, because I think you've sort of touched on it. But uh, Rashitza, which is the official Twitter name of this person, uh, will we see a striker come in this window? And then Charlie asks. We've seen a tone change from you guys about incomings. It appears a striker to compete with Pukki is now up there as a firm target, while centre-back appears to be being toned down and Andrew Omabamadeli being talked up for the season ahead. Can we say funds are being diverted from centre-back to striker? I don't think it's quite straightforward, is that, is it? No, I wouldn't have thought so, no. I mean, that's why, and we've touched on this again in this pod today, that, you know, what you can't, you can't, you can't, Produce a fixed position at the, I don't know, the thirty first of May, end of last season. We want these players. We're willing to pay this amount of money, or we want these positions even, because clearly there has been an evolutionary process. You know, Norwich will have gone for players, Ayer, the obvious one, and and not got the answers they wanted. So you move on, whether it's new targets or when you get back in a pre season cycle, and Omabama Daily by all accounts is is catching the eye, and you know that probably behind the scenes that the Gibsons and Hanleys are going to be fit, then, you know, things change. And and Connor's point about Timu, I thought was spot on, that maybe at the start of the summer, you know, they expect Timu to be fit and firing and have a good Euros and maybe then he's bouncing into the Premier League campaign 100%. That isn't the case. You know, he, he limped through the Euros, not metaphorically rather than injury-wise. Don't think the injury is the issue now, but clearly that there was a lack of match fitness and um, he's had his issues in the Premier League in terms of his fitness it's 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 logical to assume Norwich have maybe whereas the position at the start of the summer in terms of the strikers was we don't really need to worry or at least prioritise that now there is a little bit of a maybe an internal conversation that you know can we rely on Timu's body to hold up for example we don't know where we are with Hugel and Ida in terms of their ability to step up and lead, lead the team in the Premier League so I don't. Th- I don't think there's. It's a case of there's. There's a fixed position, and then that position changes. What we have, clearly, is an evolving situation to meet the needs of equipping a squad of players and an eleven that are better than what they went into the window with. And in terms of the finances, well, again, that's not a fixed position because at the start of the summer they haven't sold Emi Buendia, so they'll have had a, a, a scenario in mind if that didn't happen in terms of the finances they could uh, spend in the market. And now a scenario where if they were to sell him and they got the, the figures that they felt were justifiably that they could expect, that they could maybe push the boat out a little bit, to use that phrase, in terms of what they could bring in. So, you know, I, I don't I don't think it's a case of that they've suddenly uh, tacked away in a completely different direction in terms of their targets and what they wanted to bring in. I think they had priorities, and those priorities were clearly at the start of the summer, central midfield, centre-back, uh, keeper, obviously, and uh, and then doing something in terms of a wide area for a player who could also operate down the middle, which is in turned out to be Rashita. But that isn't to say that there were other areas as a squad. If things changed in terms of the assets that they have already, or, or in terms of the finances they got available, that they wouldn't consider. Because ultimately, as we've maybe seen in the last day or two, you know, Lee's Malou maybe wasn't a player who would have been very high on the radar at the start of the summer. There's an opportunity that they could take. They've taken it and they brought in a player who maybe wasn't one they would have at the very start of summer, if you just spoke to Stuart Webber, was one who was that high on their priority list. So, you know, the ability to adapt and sense an opportunity and then make the most of it is what has set Norwich apart in terms of football league recruitment, certainly uh, in recent windows under Webber and Scott and Farker. Um, And they're trying to do the same, but in a much more competitive Premier League market now with price tags that are far more inflated to getting Timu Puki on a free or Emi Buendia for an initial one and a half million or Tim Krul on a free. The landscape has shifted dramatically and Norwich have to try and within that still be as creative as they have been in terms of their recruitment. So um, I, I, I don't think it's, I think it'd be more strange if they were still wedded to, we want these four positions and these are the only four and we don't envisage that there'll be any outgoings kind of thing. I think you have to, and, and ultimately, we're not talking about right back. But the reality is, if you know, talking of Everton in terms of Rafa Benitez, but if Everton again were linked to Max Aarons at the start of the summer, uh, start of the weekend, sorry, 
if that materialises into a tangible move, they'll need to do a right back. And right here, right now, they're not looking to do a right back because they have a very, very capable young right back. But they have to be ready that if that scenario plays out and the money's too good to turn down, then they have to go out into the market again and bring in a right back. So it's it's essentially a moving soap opera throughout the summer. Um, and and with that, you have to be flexible if you're Stuart Webber because if you're not, you're going to get caught out. And ultimately, you'll go into this season and at the end of this window with maybe the squad and the eleven isn't dramatically strengthened. And if that is the case, then by Stuart Webber's own measure, they'll have failed in the window. Yeah, I'd imagine Stuart is spinning about 10 plates at any one time at this time of year, isn't he? Probably not getting a, a great deal of sleep. This is when he really earns his money. And, and for me, this is where the model of having a sporting director and head coach really is emphasised that it is fit for modern purposes. But to, to have one man nowadays controlling all of these ins and outs, that, that is going to obviously dictate the vast majority of your time and take away from you being able to concentrate on the tactical side of things, which we know is is so important and so subtle uh, at the top level in the Premier League. It's we, Quite often, the tactics that can win a game in the Premier League aren't even noticed by the majority of people in the stands, particularly if they've had a few beers. It's not until they go home and, and, and read the full analysis or or watch match of the day or whatever that they realise those subtle little tweaks which have actually changed the course of the game. And, and we've probably seen that during the, during the Euros. Italy in the final, for, for instance, made a made a tactical tweak during the game, didn't they? But um, there we go. Um, we will keep you up to date with that moving soap opera, of course. Um, and finally, uh, it, for the mailbag, uh, Paul Frewer, I'll put this to you, Connor, are European loans still a viable option for us since Brexit? Um, I don't off the top of my head. The loan limits is it is it two Premier League loans and an, uh, four overall, or is it five overall? I'd need to check. I've got five. I had five in my head before you started, so I'll five, stick then. with I that. But I think four. we need to clarify. Yeah, but it's it's two Premier League loans, isn't it? And those two loans can't be from the same club. So essentially, Norwich couldn't now get another loanee from Chelsea, for example. So mm. it'd have to be from one of the other Premier League clubs. And then, yeah, you've got a bit more of a license with sort of overseas loans. I think you can get three of those. Um, and yeah, they would sort of apply with all the all the Brexit regulations as far as I'm aware, um, which would mean that they'd still have to qualify in terms of points and whatnot. So there will be some markets that are open for Norwich City in terms of loans and there'll be some markets that are closed. But realistically, when you're in the Premier League, the whole Brexit situation becomes a little bit easier because the caliber of player that you chase increases and that means inevitably that they're probably playing in the in the top leagues somewhere or another so it, it does probably make it a little bit easier in that regard um so so yeah that's that's what i'd say yes to loans abroad that's still very much a a live option uh for, for Norwich city obviously we saw them sign Ibrahim Amadou, didn't we, last time, Ralph Fearman as well. There, those two loans would still make it in terms of um in terms of the Brexit regulations, for example. So they're not they're not too restricted in what they can do on that front. I've just pulled that up while you were talking there. So I think it this is a little bit misleading because as as you say, that Norwich had uh, Fairman, Amadou and Roberts all on loan, didn't they, at the start of the season two years ago. But on, on the Premier League website, it says Premier League clubs may not register more than two players on loan at any one time. But I don't think that's including um, non-domestic loans, is it? Because yeah. they are technically seen as uh, temporary transfers rather than loans, aren't they? Um, so the maximum number of loans registrable in the same season is four. And under no circumstances shall more than one be from the same club at any one time. So, so like you were, like you were saying there. So, um, yes. But in terms of in terms of Brexit, yeah, I think we've sort of uh, we've gone over that quite quite a bit now. Haven't we? And, and hopefully, it seems like Norwich have um, have been on the money with it. They've been, as we saw with Yanulis in in January, that they are uh, they have been awake to the challenges that the that Brexit has brought to the work permit situation and stuff. But um that will do. Thank you very much for for your questions. And um, we will of course be at the Walks Friday night. We'll bring you as much as we can. Uh, we're we're aiming to have all the usual coverage, Paddy's pointers, match day live blog report, video verdicts, interviews. We'll bring you as much as we can from that game as preseason really gets up to speed. So uh, do make sure that you check out pinkin.com on Friday night or the EDP and Evening News websites. And we'll have the Pinkin inside the EDP and Evening News in print on Saturday as well. So we'll have it all covered for you. But for now, thank you very much for listening. We also come to you on Future Radio 107.8 FM, whether you are listening to us on the Pinkin podcast feed or on the Pinkin YouTube channel. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll catch up with you very soon.